couple of weeks ago in uh, Promise Keepers, and you'll see me reference it a little bit more in this message, we, we were discussing uh, the legalism of the Pharisees, and then we got into the topic of liberty. And we had a, we had a shortened uh, discussion because we could have gone further and further in it. And then I was thinking, well, what, are, what am I going to preach about this week? Because I was in Romans chapter 12, and I want to continue in Romans. Well, guess what? The, this chapter is about liberty. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, for those not familiar uh, with church, with Grace Community Church, uh, we are expositional. Uh, we normally go through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Pastor Josh just finished Jonah and Nahum with us. We're now in the Christmas season. We had a couple of specials from Dave the Elder. This is Dave the Younger, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, and so um, th- th- there's an opportunity for me to continue where I've been going in Romans before Pastor Josh starts a whole new series right after Christmas. Um, <clears throat> in Romans, the first 11 chapters of Romans, uh, Paul covers the doctrinal understanding of God's righteousness in the gospel and our standing before God. And the last five chapters turn to the practical aspects of living Christian life for God, our obligation to God for what he has done for us. Can you put the next slide up, please? So there's some themes that we've looked at. <laughs> um, in, in chapter 12, Verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, therefore meaning because of everything that God has done for us, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, and notice I underlined, holy and acceptable to God. Not the way that we define it, but the way that God defines it, which is your spiritual worship. And then the last time I spoke to you, I spoke about uh, uh, love. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Underlined, love one another with brotherly affection. And that's going to be the theme of today's message. Outdo one another in showing honor. And although we didn't look at chapter 13 together, Paul does say, love does no wrong to a neighbor. So for those who are able to stand... uh, let me. Uh, I, I will read out uh, four, uh, chapter 14, verses 1 through 23. It's a lot of material we're covering. Uh, <clears throat> As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while one esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor to the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor to the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide 
never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one whom Christ, for whom Christ died. So do not let what you <clears throat> excuse me, regard as good be spoken as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God, Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you <clears throat> have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith, for whatever, we <clears throat> whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Heavenly Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, for the gift of your word. We thank you for revealing your truths to us. We thank you that your Holy Spirit convicts us, Lord, of the things that we need to address in our lives. As we go through this passage, Lord, I pray that you'll help my words to be clear, that you'll help the people understand what is being taught here and that each one of us will evaluate ourselves and so that we can see if we are truly holy and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So this part of Paul's letter is addressing a relationship concern between two groups in the church at Rome. Uh, in this uh, text, he clearly uh, defines one as being weak, and thus by inference, the other one is considered to be strong. And in fact, in 15.1, Paul says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. <clears throat> so with regards to the, who the strong and the weak are, uh, I did some research, a number of different opinions, <laughs> okay, but for, uh, instead of going through them for the sake of time and clarity, I'm going to present what appeared to be the most satisfactory proposal that best fit, fits the text and is preferred by authors such as Douglas Moo, and I'm going to quote, the weak were mainly Jewish Christians who refrained from certain kind of foods and observed certain days out of continuing loyalty to the Mosaic law. In 1 Corinthians, Paul's talking about um, food to idols. That's a Gentile community he was talking to. This one, he's talking to a community, mixture of Jews and Gentiles. But the weak here are considered to be the Jewish Christians because they're still hanging on to some of the observations of the, of the Mosaic law. So what does weak in faith mean in verse 1? As for the one who is weak in faith. First of all, this is not to be misinterpreted as a weak will or a weak character that is easily led astray into temptation. So here, it's not, it, Paul will not be talking about somebody, well, if I have a beer and then somebody else has a beer, then they have a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth, that they get tempted to have more. That is not what he's talking about here. I'm not talking about weak character. Nor does it mean they are doubtful or unsure of their salvation. Because nowhere in the text does Paul criticize them for trying to do works in order to satisfy God. He does that in Galatians. He does not address that in this text here. Nothing in the text suggests either of those two directions. Um, <clears throat> one commentator describes faith to be liberty of conscience. Another one uses the word 
conviction. Again, you, uh, quoting Moo, these are Christians who are not, and I'll insert the word yet, these are Christians who are not yet able to accept for themselves the truth that their faith in Christ, in Christ implies liberation from certain Old Testament Jewish ritual requirements. These are Jewish Christians. They believe Christ died on the cross for them, but they're still hanging on to some of their old practices. This is where they came from. This is their history. This is their heritage. Next slide, please. So, passage structure. This is a lot to cover in one message, but the, the two go together. Verses 1 through 12, he opens up addressing both the weak and the strong. But then Paul focuses on telling the weak not to stand in judgment of the strong. Verses 13 through 23, he, he balances his focus by exclusively on the strong, exhorting them not to use their liberty in a way to harm the weak. So in this passage, he's collectively talking to all of them, but he's focusing in one area, on the weak, and then balances that with comments back to the strong. In both sections, it's split out into three. There's a command. The strong not to despise the weak, and the weak are not to judge the strong. Then he goes into a theological foundation of where he's coming from and the reasoning for that command, and then he repeats the command. Likewise, in the second section, there's a command, don't cause a weaker brother to stumble, theological foundation behind that, and then the command repeated. I spent time going through that because once you see that, once you understand the way that Paul writes, it helps to put it all together. <coughs> so next slide, please. Okay, so love that, that does not judge. <coughs> First of all, love that does not judge welcomes those that God has welcomed. Uh, in, in verse 2, Paul wrote, One person believes that he may eat anything, while another person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and not let the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcome, welcomed him. The strong were looking down on the weak. They went back, oh, haven't you got past that old practice yet? You don't need to do that anymore. We, this is the way you are to live in Christ. And the weak are looking at them strong with tainted eyes. And they're judging them. <clears throat> He's not criticizing the, the weak where they are. He's not criticizing the strong for where they are in their walk. He's saying we need to understand that we're not all in the same position at the same time. God has welcomed him. The Greek word for welcome means more than just accepting someone into your community or into your home. John Stott, I thought, put it very well. It means to welcome them into one's fellowship and into one's heart. It implies warmth and of kindness of genuine love. We talked about that the last time, genuine love. The weak eat vegetables, not because they're vegetarians, but because they're abstaining from eating any meat, particularly in the presence of the strong. Table fellowship. Because of food law concerns. First of all, what type of meat is being served? Is it pork, beef, lamb? Secondly, how was it prepared? Was the blood properly drawn out of it? Is it kosher? Remember, the Jews had very strict laws on that. <clears throat> the weak are not to consider the strong with a view that well, we are the righteous remnant because we're still holding to God's written laws on this factor. 
And you're not meeting our standard. Now verse 3a is a general truism. I'm sorry, verse 3b. Um, For God has welcomed him. Okay, God welcomes all of us. But right here, Paul is speaking very specifically to the weak. Because they're doing the judging. The weak must not stand in judgment of the strong. For God has accepted the strong believer. ESV footnote. Whenever we compare somebody else to our standard, our interpretation of something, we are judging them. And we have to remember that person has been accepted by God. Love that does not judge welcomes those that God has welcomed. Somebody has a differing opinion on certain things, we welcome them with kindness, warmth. Next slide, please. Love that does not judge does all things to the honor of the Lord. So Paul's given the command. Don't despise each other. Don't judge, and particularly the weak, don't judge because God has welcomed them. They are acceptable to God. So now we get into the theological aspect of it. Verses 4. It starts off with a cultural example. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. You would never do this in that culture. If a servant has done something, it's up to the master of that servant to determine if it's acceptable or not acceptable. <clears throat> Who are you to judge someone that God has welcomed and accepted? He said, this, he said they will stand. The strong will be judged by God. And they will stand. For he will be upheld. For the Lord is able to make him stand. We also refer to Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God will upheld all of his people. Moose said, the Lord's approval is not attained by following rules pertaining to food, but by the Lord's own sustaining power. He will bring it to completion. He will enable us to stand. In verse 5, we see a second example of how their liberty can affect the relationship uh, between the weak and the strong. The observance of, or non-observance, of special days. Sabbath keeping, religious festivals, feasts, fasts, etc. This is one of the discussions we had in our our PK meeting. Sunday versus Saturday. He does not say that one is right over the other. He does not say abstaining or honoring those days is right. But that each one should be fully, and I use the word thoroughly, convinced in his mind regarding that position. You do what is right in your mind. Now, we're not talking about the um, essentials, okay? We're not talking about the things that in Bible that are absolutes. We can't do what we want in the absolutes. We're talking about the disputable things, the non-essentials. And what Paul is saying is you do, and we'll see later on while we say that, you do what is right in your mind with where you are in your faith walk. Don't look at others and talk about their faith walk. Focus on where you are in your faith walk. Verse 6, in all things... In all things, give thanks to God and do it to glorify the Lord. In all things, in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. In all things. Why? Because in verse 7 to 9, we live and die to the Lord. He tells us there's nothing that a Christian 
does, that is done with reverence to himself alone. What we do, because we are in Christ, references to Christ. Life and death are not under our control, but in the hands of the Lord. Life and death are not under our control, they're in the hands of the Lord. Therefore we live every day unto the Lord. Because he is our Lord, we live for him. Because he is our Lord, sorry, because he is also the Lord of our fellow Christians, we must respect their relationship to him and mind our own business. For he died and rose to be Lord over all. Love that does not judge. Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Leave judgment up to God. We see this in verses 10 through 12. He said in verse 10, why are you acting this way towards your Christian brother who Christ died for? Christ died for your Christian brother. How dare you judge him? How can you act that way towards him? <clears throat> For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. <clears throat> it's in verse 10. We see here the words, all. We see the word each. We see the word every. We see the word us, everyone. Everyone will be standing before the Lord. Now notice when Paul uses his phrase, he says, for we will all stand. And in verse 12 he says, then each of us will give an account. He's talking about Christians here. Just talking about Christians. But I want to take a slight side road here I told you that the first um, 11 chapters of Romans was about God's glory and God's righteousness in the gospel for those who are not familiar with that structure um, 111 through 117 summarizes the gospel is the revelation of God's righteousness then 118 through 320, Paul very clearly in, uh, writes, God's righteousness, God, sorry, God's righteous wrath against man is justifiable. Everyone that is born is a sinner. Everyone sh stands against God's wrath. God's wrath is righteous upon everyone. However, 321 through 1136, the major part of the portion there, God's grace declares all believers righteous in faith. Next slide, please. Those that have chosen to put their faith in the work of Christ on the cross those who have chosen to believe in God's promises that through faith in Christ, our sins, the wrath was put upon Christ, not upon us. Our sins have been fully paid for, absolutely, completely, past, present, future. But it's by grace alone. And of Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith. <clears throat> And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. If there's anybody here today that thinks, hey, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. I do more good than I do bad. God's going to let me into heaven. No, nope, not by works. Everyone d deserved Condemnation. But in God's mercy, he sent Christ to die on the cross. So if there's anyone here who has not yet 
fully accepted Christ as their personal saviour, I would just ask that you talk with Pastor Josh, talk with one of the elders, talk with me, talk with any other the leaders. We'll be more than pleased to help you understand more of what Christ has done for you. So that, and then if you put your faith in Christ, you will not stand before God on the final judgment and be fearing hell. But we will be standing on the last day for what is known as the evaluated judgment. Christians, I'm talking to now, Christians will be judged by how we have lived our Christian life, including our response to other Christians. Have we shown them the love that God showed us? So a short principle for this section. Believers, live to the Lord and leave judgment to God. Focus on the Lord. Focus on showing his love to all your brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, now we move into the uh, next section. Next slide, please. Love that subordinates liberty. The problem or the challenge in the church is that the... the uh, the Gentile Christians and liberated Jewish Christians no longer followed the Old Testament Mosaic Law requirements. They knew that it was all taken care of in Christ. But some of the younger, not younger, um, less further along in their faith, Jewish Christians were hanging on to their past. <coughs> So now he's going to start talking to the strong. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block on hindrance in the way of a brother. Take off this negative action and put on a positive action. Make it a conscious decision. Make it a determined and resolute decision not to cause a brother to stumble. We have to understand why this is. If, if, if me, my exercising liberty could lead to a peer pressure causing a person who is weak in their faith to go against their conscience and do something that I think they should be doing, that's causing them to sin. We'll see that, we'll see that more in verse 23. If I exercise my liberty and cause somebody else to go against their conscience. Eating the meat, or whatever it is, is not the sin. Going against their conscience is the sin. Again, we'll see that in verse 23. So he says in verse 14, these things are clean, acceptable, to the strong. Those who are at a certain point of their faith. But if the, those who are weak in their faith consider it to be unclean, then to him or her, it is unclean. In Mark 17, verses 18 and 19, Jesus speaking, Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Then in parenthesis, Mark wrote, thus he declared all foods clean. That is a biblical reference where people can go to and say, that's where it says that all the foods are now clean. Uh, we know the story of Peter. Peter had the vision from God that nothing was unclean and went to Cornelius' house and stayed some days. And when he stayed some days, I'm going to figure that he had meals with them. So he ate with the Gentiles, and he ate their food. And yet later in Galatians, Paul has to rebuke Peter for not eating with the Gentiles when he was pressured by other Jews. See, people differ in our ability to internalize a truth. And this is your walk in faith. As you 
the longer you walk in faith, the more you understand what it is that Christ has done for you, the liberation, the freedom that we have in Christ. There may be others that are not quite on that same stage of their walk. We are not to do anything to cause them to stumble. Verse 15. For if you, your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ has died. If I do something selfishly, because I know it's okay for me to do this, and there's a person near me that is not of that same mindset, I could be destroying their faith. <clears throat> You know, Christ cared enough to die for that person. Can I not care enough to help them with their faith? Can I not care enough to maybe not eat that meal? The word destroy. Shriner. Faith cannot survive. Faith cannot survive if people constantly flout what they consider to be a moral Absolute. John Stott wrote, destroy, seriously damage their Christian discipleship. You want to do all that for a, for a non-essential? To verse 16. So therefore, don't cause others to revile the divine gift of liberty. What does he say in 16? <clears throat> So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. So therefore, don't cause others to revile the divine gift of liberty with slanderous talk. Have you seen that guy, what he eats? He's, he calls himself a Christian and he eats that stuff. He calls himself a Christian and he doesn't do this on a Sunday or does that on a Sunday, whichever way you want to talk about it. Okay. <coughs> This also harms the gospel message. When the outside world sees Christian A criticizing Christian B, what does that do for the gospel? What does that do for Christ? Don't let what we consider to be right cause harm to the gospel. Don't let it be spoken of as evil. Next slide, please. Why? Why should we not cause somebody else to stumble? Verse 17. <clears throat> For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul is, <laughs> Paul is doing here is the weak needed perspective regarding judging. The strong also need perspective regarding exercising their use of liberty. And here he reminds them, what's more important? What's more important? For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> came up with an interesting uh, observation. And I, I, I appreciated this having gone through, as I told you two weeks ago, we talked about um, legalism and the Pharisees. This is what Moo says. Theirs, the strong, paradoxically, is the same fault as that of the Pharisees. Theirs, the strong, paradoxically, is the same fault as that of the Pharisees, only in reverse. The Pharisees insisted on strict adherence to the ritual law at the expense of justice, mercy, and grace. We studied that in Matthew chapter 12 recently. The strong are insisting on exercising their freedom from the ritual law 
at the expense of righteousness, peace, and joy. So you can be way over on this side in legalism, or you can be way over on this side on liberty and be causing concerns for people. Now, there are differing views here on um, what righteousness, what peace, and what joy has been spoken about. Um, <clears throat> Stott takes the broader context of Romans and says, well, this is obviously our righteousness in Christ, our peace with God. Moo takes a narrower view in that he says the immediate context focuses on relations amongst believers. So righteousness here would be right behavior within the community of believers. Peace would be harmony and mutual support with one another. And these are characterized by joy. And all this is through the working of the Holy Spirit. Verse 18. Whoever thus serves the Lord, meaning all the things I've talked about already, is acceptable to God. Holy and acceptable to God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which means give up some of the things that you want to do or that you used to do, so that you are holy and acceptable God, and this is your spiritual worship. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So love that subordinates of liberty does not tear down, but builds up. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. When we pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding, we're strengthening the church. Anything we do in the opposite direction is weakening the church. He says, do not destroy the work of God. <clears throat> Everything is indeed clean, but if it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what is eats. It, it, okay, next slide. All things are lawful. The liberty. But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful. But not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Where's the focus? It's not on me. It's on my brother. It's on my sister in Christ. I, whatever I'm doing, I need to make sure it's not causing that person to stumble in any way. And it's up to me to sacrifice myself so that they can grow in their faith. Last slide, please. That's not a new one. You saw it before. So verse 21. <clears throat> it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. It is good not to exercise your liberty if it's going to cause a person concern. That is what is holy and acceptable to God. 22. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Don't flaunt it. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with the faith that you have. Okay? God honors the faith that you have. But if your faith causes another person to stumble, God is no longer honored. Verse 22, 23, those, <clears throat> sorry, let me read it because it's important to understand this. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. In short, if you're doing what you believe, you're blessed. The next one's a bit of a concern. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. The 
because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We're talking about the non-essentials. Those who are true to their own beliefs on the non-essentials mean that they are trusting God with their life, with their faith, with their walk. They're doing everything to the Lord for the glory of the Lord. They're blessed. But do not be of wavering faith. To act counter to your conscience is sin. To cause a brother to act counter to his conscience, to cause a sister to act counter to their conscience, is causing them to sin. ESV footnote. Faith glorifies God by trusting him. Lack of faith dishonors God. So, uh, principle. Believers must willingly make sacrifices in order to build others up. You know we're going to end with an application, right? So, what does this mean? Question. Where might my actions or attitudes be seen as condescending? When I'm in a group, where do my comments maybe put another person down or make me look to be better or further along in my faith because they're not there? Or judging regarding another person's religious practices or their faith walk. A number of us here, including me, came out of another denomination. We remember those things about those other denominations. There were some things that I really appreciated because it helped me focus on Christ. Somebody else may see me do that and say, what are you doing that for? I remember one time, um, something simple. I was in a big group meeting. I kneeled down to pray. Why are you stand kneeling down? We don't have to do that now. Because that was my conscience. I felt that I was kneeling before God. I'm not saying they weren't as in touch with God as me, but that was my where I felt. Obviously, I still remember that event. Okay? Fortunately, that didn't affect my walk. How might I be causing another person to stumble? Always be aware of what it is you're doing around a brother and sister in Christ. And you know how to f know if you're going to cause them to stumble? You need to find out where they are in their faith walk. Maybe that means communicating a little bit more. Sharing our walk with them, letting them share their walk with you in an open... Uh, well, I mean, Saturday morning, Promise Keepers is re a really great group. Um, we've had some good discussions and it's been very clear that there are people that have um, differing opinions on certain topics and yet not once have I seen any animosity come out of it. Not once have I seen any demeaning come out of it. It's just been guys debating and sharing. And we're having so much fun. I think yeah, they told me, yes, it was a two-hour meeting. It used to be one. <laughs> two-hour meeting. I weren't there, so maybe it would have been three. Um, but, but, but the point is, you need to be in fellowship with people to understand them and know where they are. Now, the strong have a responsibility. They are to help those who are less developed in their faith develop. Not by saying, well, this is the way you have to do it, but helping them to come to these understanding by themselves or in, in, at their own pace. How could I lovingly build up those who are less mature in the faith than I? Spend time with them. Augustine. Everybody quoted Augustine on this one. In essentials, unity. Non-debatable, unity. Be all in agreement on the essentials. In the non-essentials, 
Show tolerance. In all things, charity. So, we are all in Christ. Love for one another builds his church. Let's get building. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, Lord, for this opportunity to spend time in your word. We thank you that Christ did die for us on the cross and that the love he showed to us is the perfect example of the love we are to show for others. Father, I would just pray that uh, you would help each one of us to evaluate ourselves, that we would allow your spirit to convict us of those areas that, uh, where we need to grow and that in your mercy and grace that you will help us grow. Lord, we just pray that you are glorified through our study of your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.